Thank you. I'm Sarah Grimm from the Wisconsin Historical Society and want to welcome everybody this afternoon. Uh, we are here today for today's practical digital preservation webinar on the governance of long-term digital information. And as you can see here, we are definitely nearing the end of this webinar series, which we, are, which we uh, started in January. We have one more webinar remaining, which is on June 13th. Uh, and that's going to be an international perspective on best practices in digital preservation. It's something new that we haven't tried before. Uh, and for this one, we are going to bring in some guest speakers from Europe to talk about their programs and experiences. So I hope you can really join us for that one. Uh, feel free to sign up at the bottom. We have the web address at the bottom of this page, so feel free. Uh, I'm not going to speak very long today because we have an action-packed afternoon with some great speakers. So I'm just going to turn it right over to David. Thank you very much, Sarah. So hi, everybody. A very warm welcome to you. My name is David Portman. I'm the Marketing Manager at Preservica. And it is a great pleasure uh, to be working with COSA on this Practical Digital Preservation series of briefings and workshops. And once again, we have a fantastic lineup for you guys coming up today. Um, just very quickly, before we get into our speakers and introductions, um, if you're not familiar with Preservica, uh, Preservica is a specialist in digital preservation software uh, with over a decade of experience in the field of digital preservation. Um, we provide cloud hosted and on-premise solutions uh, with over 100 organizations uh, using Preservica across the globe, uh, making up our very collaborative and vibrant user community. And that includes uh, uh, over 18 US state archives. So like I said, we've got some great speakers coming up for you today, uh, providing their guidance, sharing some of their knowledge and their experiences. So let's go in and meet some of our speakers today. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Doug Robinson. Doug has served as an executive director of the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, that's NASIO, and he's been doing that since 2004. Uh, founded in 1969, NACIO is the only national organization representing state chief information officers of the 50 states and territories. Doug is responsible for the overall execute, executive leadership of the association, including strategic plan and policy execution, government affairs, strategic alliances, emerging issues, and board and committee oversight. Doug also provides strategic direction for NACIO's initiatives and advocacy positions on issues such as cybersecurity, enterprise architecture, IT governance, information sharing, and business innovation. And Doug is a frequent speaker, panelist, author, and recognized national expert representing state CIOs, policy issues, priorities, and trends in state government IT. Among his recognitions, Doug received the 2015 Advocacy for Archives Award presented by the Council of State, State Archivists, and his career spans over 38 years in public sector information technology, including positions in state government, higher education, and IT consulting. Prior to joining NACIO, Doug served as Executive Director on the Governor's Office for Technology, Commonwealth, and uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky. So a huge welcome there to Doug. So moving on, a big welcome to Sarah Kuntz, who has worked as the State Archives of North, uh, as the Archivist at the State North uh, Archives of North Carolina uh, since 2012. Um, Sarah actually joined as a graduate student intern um, at North Carolina in 1992. Sarah served on the Board of Directors for COSA, including a term as Council President. She is active in the COSA's State Electronic Records Initiative, focusing her efforts in the Education Subcommittee and its Institute of Museum and Library Services grant to train archivists on the management and preservation of electronic records. Sarah also serves on COSA's Advocacy Committee, working on advocacy needs for archives on the state and federal level. And I'm also delighted to uh, welcome Laurie Ashley, so Laurie J. Ashley recently joined Preservica as an industry market development manager. And in this new role, Laurie is responsible for identifying industry and customer requirements and also developing compelling use cases to advance digital preservation capabilities and solutions. Laurie was previously an independent consultant who advised public and private sector organizations on how to improve the efficiency and performance of the records and information management programs. 
Laurie is a co-developer of the Digital Preservation Capability Maturity Model, that's the DPCMM, and that's used by the Council of State Archivists today. So welcome, Laurie. And a huge welcome to Roger Kreisman. So Roger is the Governor's Records Archivist at the Library of Virginia, and Roger's worked there uh, since 1997. Roger is the lead archivist on the Kane email project and an editor for the blog, Out of the Box. Notes from the Library of Virginia, and also notes from the Library of Virginia. Roger's received his BA in History from Millersville University and his MA in Applied History from the University of South Carolina. Okay, so without further ado then, we're going to have a quick look at the agenda and then we'll get into the into today's sessions. So we've got a lot to get through um, in the short time we've got. Um, we're going to kick things off in just a few minutes. I'll hand over to Doug. And Doug's going to discuss uh, data governance issues of shared concern to state CIOs and state archivists and how, highlight how collaborating with, collaborating with state archives can help state CIOs address many of the issues uh, identified in the 2017 state CIO top 10 priorities list. After Doug, we're going to hear from Sarah, who's going to outline the services and other forms of assistance that the Council of State, Ar state Archivists and individual state and territorial archives offer to state CIOs. Following Sarah, we're going to hear from Laurie, who's going to share some of the highlights from the latest research uh, by the Information Governance Initiative into governing and preserving long-term digital information and records. And the last of our guest speakers uh, before moving into a Q&A portion of the session is, is Roger. Um, Roger's going to uh, provide real talk about um, in, in quite detail the real world challenges and opportunities associated with capturing and preserving the email of an outgoing governor. Okay, so and then at the end we're going to have a Q&A. So do think about some questions uh, during the time uh, that the speakers are delivering their their sessions, and we'll regroup at the end and have a, a Q&A. So a great opportunity to put your questions to our guys today. Okay, so. I would like to hand over to Doug, so I'm just going to pass the ball to Doug to get us started. All right. Thank you very, thank you very much, David, and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today uh, on this webinar about about a topic uh, around governance and uh, the view from the state CIOs, uh, especially around uh, strategic imperative uh, of the priorities that they have uh, and how long-term digital preservation is going to fit in there. And I'm going to do that in a number of ways, start out by quickly talking about the state IT landscape, uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and move into some of the state CR priorities for 2017, map those back to long-term digital preservation, and you'll see there's, uh, where they connect the dots between uh, those particular uh, priorities that were articulated by our CIOs back in November of 16, and then really focus on three or four forces of change. Uh, and where they fit into the overall landscape. Uh, touching a little bit on state data, uh, we do not capture uh, particular direct information on electronic records uh, in our surveys, but we do talk a lot about data. And even there's a relationship there, you know, understanding that the record is a lot more than simply that data, uh, but we do have some very good information about how state CIOs are thinking and planning and acting uh, in the state data world. So let's jump right in and talk a little bit about the state IT landscape. Uh, what we have is really an overview of some of the major initiatives in the states, uh, looking at uh, particularly the challenges of the cost pressures and the fiscal pressures that states are finding themselves in. Uh, we're now in an unusual situation, 2017 going into fiscal year 18 for many states where revenue growth has been le less than certainly has been in the last several years. Uh, we're seeing budget cuts, in fact, in 17, over 25 states uh, took at least one, if not more, midterm budget cuts, and you see many states are reporting that they're going to end the year with uh, uh, declining revenue and perhaps uh, challenge with additional budget cuts before the end of June. So the CIOs are continued pressure to find cost savings, and that really drives them to enterprise solutions and consolidation. I think the major theme I want to pick up on here about the landscape is that we see this continued evolution uh, from what we have called the owner-operator business model, which has been the tradition and, and certainly historically for the last four decades for state CR organizations that they deliver IT services and infrastructure to state agencies, uh, predominantly in a chargeback model. 
We're seeing that slowly evolve with a focus on much more as everything as a service. And I've got some data to support that from our surveys and, and different models of delivery. In fact, much more private partnerships and certainly taking advantage of cloud services. So we'll spend a moment talking about cloud. A cyber continues to be the number one priority for state COs and is a major business risk, as you all know, to states. And that was certainly highlighted last week uh, with the WannaCry ransomware attack, which is really an attempt at, at disrupting the business continuity of many, many organizations in over 150 uh, countries. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cloud services, a little bit about data. Uh, uh, legacy modernization is certainly on their plate, as well as per performing, re uh, getting through the current reform around particular aspects of the challenges of state IT acquisition. And one thing we all face, uh, regardless of the line of business we're in in state government, is workforce challenges. And that's certainly highlighted in areas of IT, uh, with a special emphasis on, on cybersecurity skills. So states are continuing to be, be challenged by that. Let me provide you with a, the top 10. Uh, take a quick look at this and you will see this has not changed much uh, since 2015. There's a couple of new items that have appeared in moving up the list, uh, particularly around uh, data management and analytics and agile and incremental software develop, delivery. They, they were not on the list uh, three years ago. The others have been on the list. Security has been on the top 10 list of CIOs uh, since its inception in 2006. So uh, we're seeing uh, certainly that being highlighted uh, with an increased emphasis across the state. The states, again, since that time period have been uh, moving through the phases of consolidation and optimizing their IT environment. And we'll talk a bit about that as we look at how these map to, at least in, in my perspective, to the long-term digital preservation discussion. I think there's a linkage to each one of these when we talk about that, particularly though when you look at things like enterprise IT governance, and we'll spoke, speak a little bit about that later about the importance of, of governance in this area. And one, quite frankly, if you look at uh, the last decade, has not received enough attention. So that's, I think, certainly why I, I uh, titled this Action Required. Uh, I think some assembly required would have been adequate, but I think we need more than that. I think we, we've seen, unfortunately, not enough progress in the last decade around the governance of our electronic records and certainly around digital preservation. But as you can see, all these pieces can fit in. There's opportunities for cloud services. There's certainly more opportunities for consolidation uh, of the agency elements and enterprise view, and that's certainly NASIO's bias is toward, toward the enterprise solutions, enterprise investments, and enterprise delivery, uh, and trying to reduce the complexity and diversity of the solution set uh, that states uh, have invested in in the past, and that's continued to be very challenging given the vast legacy uh, situation that state governments have, and most states are spending 75 to 80 percent of their IT budget just on maintaining their as-is environment, maintaining their, their current legacy systems and solutions, including uh, their electronic records and data. Uh, they're not advancing very quickly, so uh, that's something to continue to, uh, to continue to look at. So as we drill down a little bit on a few of these things, I want to talk about you know, what I characterize as the major forces of change, are things that uh, are, are really pressuring state CIOs and the state IT executives uh, to move forward in a variety of ways. One, there's certainly some pressure from the budget side, but there's also opportunities, and there are opportunities given new technologies and new services to change the models, uh, both in the service delivery channel as well as the sourcing options. And again, this is the transition from being uh, the full owner-operator of infrastructure and applications to one where there's uh, opportunities to move into the marketplace and to look at software as a service and, and, and other uh, applications and different business models. And we're seeing some of that, and I'll provide you some data in a moment about that shift. And clearly the adoption of cloud services and cloud solution is probably the major force of change over the last four to five years. We started tracking uh, cloud adoption in 2009 with our national survey, and we've seen a, a double-digit percentage increase uh, every year in terms of what states say they're doing uh, in cloud, whether it's on-premise uh, or with a commercial cloud provider uh, and SaaS solution off-premise. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I will highlight a little bit about the data and uh, certainly the relationship to the generation of electronic records and, uh, and where states are. So I think if you uh, look at uh, the, the question that we posed to state CIOs in our 2016 survey about how they planned 
to deliver or obtain IT services over the next three years. And this is a rolling set of data we've been asking. As you can see, uh, they intend to expand shared services. Uh, they intend to, again, increase outsourced business applications through a software as a service model. Uh, that would not have been discussed a decade ago. That was on the table. Uh, they're expanding their managed services. I can tell you that they've already downsized their data centers. We have almost a third of the states that are down to a single data center with a backup. Uh, and that 90% uh, uh, of the states aspire to move toward data center consolidation based on our most recent uh, survey data. Uh, so we're going to see an expansion of outsourcing. We're going to see a reduction of state IT staff. Uh, two things that were clear in another question on our survey was uh, the states do not intend to build new data centers, nor do they intend to increase the size of their IT staff. So those would have been uh, questions that would have been answered very, very differently a decade ago. Uh, all the states were looking to build new data centers and expand their staff. So clearly the economics and the, and the budget realities have caught up uh, with the marketplace opportunities and marketplace realities. So I think we're going to see more and more states begin to look at moving critical business applications, things like HR and ERP financial models, they're already moving in that direction where they're going to put those, again, perhaps on an off-premise cloud with a commercial provider. And I think there's, you know, if you look at that in terms of a cloud situation, there's definitely some advantages that I've identified here that the states see the moving uh, to cloud. And, and the ones that have, whether it's on-premise with a provider or on-premise as a private cloud, uh, that is hosted and, and managed by the CIO, and, that, and that's the predominant model today. Uh, but again, it gives them a lot more flexibility and agility. They can, they can get, uh, basically compute services or storage by the drink. You can ramp up and ramp down as needed. Uh, there's been a debate about security, but I think if you talk to any of the states and the state CIOs, they will tell you uh, that the security provisioning is actually probably superior in many of the cloud solutions that they have today. Uh, the states cannot simply maintain that level of investment. So what they were doing is, is shifting the what used to be traditionally the capital spend or the capex spend of states to one where it's going to be built into the operating model and they're going to consume services as they need or they're going to consume things like payroll and personnel and it's not going to be an on-premise solution and not going to have to basically upgrade servers and software every five years. And I bring this to your attention simply because this transition, as we've seen it over the last three to four years, has implications for not just IT, but in fact, it's a business decision that we've seen uh, disruptive uh, activities going on in terms of state budgeting and procurement. Uh, state agencies don't know how to actually procure cloud solutions. The budgets don't accommodate a service model. They're, they're, they are built for an acquisition model where CIOs buy stuff. They buy hardware and software and boxes and wires, and so that's going to change. Uh, we've asked some questions in our 16 survey and, and previous to that about uh, their migration plans. And you can see uh, that 75 percent, three-quarters of our CIOs either have a migration plan in place uh, or they're developing one. Again, this is particularly targeted towards making decisions about whether they're cloud first, that they're going to look at new services that need to be spun up by state agencies moving to the cloud, or they're going to make decisions about legacy applications, and rather than investing in the next generation of, of refresh, they're going to simply move that. And it may be in a private cloud, but they're going to get more applications in that way. And again, you can see uh, the predominant model today is still uh, the private cloud, which is the hosted generally by the state CIO, but we're going to see more and more what I'd call the public uh, in, in the NIST framework or the commercial cloud computing options. Again, we, we heard from David Preservica is well known in this space, and that's a third-party entity that can either host, again, off-premise or on-premise, but to providing you with a, a service solution uh, where you're not paying a capital cost. And I think that's going to be a growth area for, uh, for states, certainly. And then finally, I think if you look at some of the uh, activities that you, that you may find interesting, uh, we did ask a question and have for several years about categories and services that CIOs uh, intend to move or migrate to cloud. And we got some uh, data here from, again, 2016, and I've highlighted a few of the topics. You can see these, those are relatively low, but again, this is the CIO perspective, so they may not be aware of what's going on across their enterprise particularly. But as you can see, uh, these topics that I've highlighted uh, on the pick list are, are relatively low compared to something like email collaboration. We know GIS uh, is using cloud storage extensively across 
a number of states, and certainly many states have moved to collaborative uh, office products, uh, and you can see a fairly high percentage there. So again, I think we're going to see this grow, particularly if there's more, uh, again, a governance and discussion about uh, enterprise investments, particularly around uh, digital archives and long-term digital preservation, because the, the options in the marketplace have now caught up, certainly, to the, the tremendous demand, the latent demand that states uh, and states really haven't been keeping up and moving for a variety of reasons. We know there's major funding and cost reasons. There may be some capability and discipline challenges. There may be challenges just around the enterprise view. It's the same challenge CIOs have is getting their handle around what's going on across the lines of business and all the executive branch agencies and the other elected officials. Uh, that is often challenging for them uh, to take that on. So we asked a question at our uh, one of our conferences last year to all of our state members, we use interactive polling. We asked them what business model was going to drive their investments over the next five years. And this, again, these were CIOs and deputies. And not surprising, it kind of mapped to our own survey. This is non-scientific, uh, but it does represent, uh, again, the general trend that we got from our 16 state CIO survey, which, uh, in fact, was responded to by 50 states. So we had a remarkable response rate. So very good data set. But you can see there, 43%. They, they envision their future as more off-premise and a more centralized enterprise model. So this is certainly going in the direction that you would see in many large private sector organizations. And I think we all got to understand that uh, states are large enterprises, uh, significant. They would be uh, uh, all in the Fortune 100. They have significant budgets. And so they're, they're beginning to look more and more like what a large private sector entity would, uh, would look like in terms of their future direction for delivering business value uh, again through technology is going to be enabled. Uh, I think they, all the CIOs recognize, and other than uh, in most cases, and I'm generalizing, that the current model they have is not sustainable because of the budget pressures and the continued cost reduction. Uh, so, and that's a philosophical view of IT as a cost center uh, as opposed to IT as enabler of business transformation. Uh, and that takes, again, a little bit more understanding by elected officials uh, that it's simply not a cost center. So let me quickly end by talking a little bit about state government. Uh, I think I don't think any of this will surprise you as NASIO's had uh, many years of writing about data management, data governance, uh, data governance I think being a subset of, of broad information governance. Uh, but we know that there is a, a lagging maturity in this space and we've been trying to fill that by uh, provide some thought leadership and also some direction about what states should be doing in terms of managing their most strategic asset, which is the data that they use. And so what, today I think this is not uh, uh, to, to criticize the states in terms of their uh, as-is position, but this is the reality I think that those of us in state government understand that this is the challenges that we have across the state government. We have a lot of silos of data. We have uh, high, high issues with data quality. Uh, data sharing and information sharing is, in fact, very, very difficult. And we have increasing security risks and privacy. We certainly see that played out across the front page of the newspapers all the time. So all these, I think, relate to, in fact, uh, using that data to then create electronic records, which uh, have to be preserved. So it takes a lot of governance and management to, uh, to kind of wrestle this thing to the ground. I think the other thing that we've seen uh, that states are experiencing certainly over the last decade is just major changes in state data. What traditionally was structured data, in fact, in some cases uh, 30, 40 years ago, highly structured data uh, has now given way and what we're seeing is, is a growth in semi-structured and totally unstructured data. We have social media data. We have data from Internet of Things, IoT. We have data from unmanned aerial systems. We have GIS data which is more semi-structured than it used to be. We have body-worn camera data, so we have object data, which is video and audio, uh, which is certainly not considered, and they take vast amount of storage to manage what, in fact, has, could be a very critical uh, electronic record in the course of a legal disposition, uh, and it's, it can be highly unstructured. So it takes a lot of, of care and feeding to move this data, and this, these changes, uh, these sources are coming from different uh, sources and they're changing dramatically and the growth is phenomenal, as you all know, in terms of uh, data growth. So what states have been doing is looking at, you know, whether or not they can capture and utilize this data. And with the state CIO agenda, you can see that uh, state, state CIOs particularly think that this is high priority. We're seeing uh, data governance and analytics reflected in a lot of new 
strategic IT plans of the CIOs. So we hope this has been moving forward gradually over the last several years. From the standpoint of uh, what's going on, you can see uh, that more than, well, about half the states say they have a long way to go. This is of our 15 survey. Uh, and again, I don't think this has changed too much. Uh, <clears throat> we have challenges in this space with the states. So they're going to move much more towards, <clears throat> excuse me, what we would call a formal management structure. But it does, does take some time. It creates you know, opportunities for building stakeholders, uh, data custodians, electronic records managers, archivists, all have to be in this. But again, you can see about half the states have made some progress. Uh, and we talk about the scope and breadth of their enterprise data management program. Again, it is not truly enterprise-wide. We have uh, about 20% of the states that indicate that they have only some executive branch uh, agencies. So, uh, and a very small percentage, one state indicated that they had a, a governance program with participation from all state uh, state government agencies in the executive branch. So again, a lot of work to, 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 that needs to be done there, a lot of uh, gaps that need to be filled over time. The CIOs see themselves certainly in some cases of uh, taking the lead and advocating for data. Uh, but uh, again, you can see here, if you look at the, the current, which is in red and the recommended, uh, they, they get, again, they have some work to do, particularly on formally documented a data architecture. Uh, it's very rare to find one in the state. Uh, very rare to find, uh, again, an enterprise architecture that articulates electronic records and digital preservation as part of their enterprise architecture. And that's something, uh, as you will see in our call to action, and I, I point this out as I end simply to say we're now 10 years uh, from our first brief on uh, electronic records management digital preservation, which was a call to action to state CIOs. That was authored by my colleague uh, Eric Sweden of our enterprise architecture program. And then uh, a year later, I, I wrote the Ready for the Challenge on state CIOs. And these are the recommendations that we placed in those reports in 2007. Uh, again, this talks about partnering and collaborating, uh, work with electronic records and digital preservation experts, work with the state archivist. But our major theme here, and it's not surprising because that's been our theme for many, many years, is that uh, we have a clear enterprise bias uh, towards these activities uh, and certainly enterprise strategy and direction, investment solutions, and they all be supported by an enterprise architecture, which is the roadmap for those investments. The, the document that will create some order out of the, the disparate chaos that takes place across state agencies. Unfortunately, we haven't seen as much progress as we'd like. Uh, I think we're going to see more because now the solutions and the business models, particularly around cloud and SaaS, have now given us a new opportunity uh, to move in these directions. But it still takes governance. It can't be it can't be avoided. So let me end from kind of what we would say and what we know from patterns of success, which really map to other areas. Uh, in the CIO's portfolio, and that is uh, enterprise governance is an imperative around this. Uh, it cannot be done, I don't think, successfully long-term uh, by individual state agencies. There's got to be collaboration. You have to have this roadmap, and as key stakeholders need to get together and have those discussions and focus on that full life cycle uh, of electronic records. Uh, they've got to leverage the architecture, and these should be uh, domains within the architecture. There should be active discussions around how electronic records fits into the other pieces of the enterprise architecture. And I think recognizing that um, there's, there's, no, there's no permanency and this is going to be constant migration. So who's keeping up with the, the technology uh, in terms of that, that architectural direction? Where are the, the policies for compliance? What are the standards? What's the metadata? What are the naming conventions? These are all things that would be part of that, that directional roadmap. And again, my point here is that discussing the trend towards consolidation, more shared service opportunities, and cloud options just gives more options for long-term digital preservation, but you can't skip the governance step. Uh, it's got to be it's got to be discussed. And so let me end by just providing you with a snapshot of some of the things that we are discussing and talking about. As you can see, a variety of topics, but data is in many of these today, particularly around delivering a new experience for citizens with digital government. Uh, I think, uh, you know, data as an asset. Uh, just uh, last week, we, we released our new report on blockchain. I see blockchain as providing a transformational opportunity for the managing of records over time. And it's something that, that, that state and local governments may be looking at. So there's always new technology 
uh, on the on the forefront that, that NASA has to address from the intersection of the policy, technology, and implementation phase. So move through a lot of that very quickly, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for our speakers. And so again, uh, all of our materials, what I what I just talked about in terms of reports and survey data, all of our new research briefs on emerging technologies are all available uh, complimentary on the NASA website, NASA.org, and you can follow us in any social media channel that you prefer. So uh, that are my remarks for today, and look forward to taking any questions later in, in the webinar. Thank you all. This down okay, to uh, Sarah Coons. And Sarah from uh, Sarah Coons from North Carolina is uh, going to be our next speaker. So the uh, great state of North Carolina and the and the, uh, and the Tar Heels are going to take over and talk about uh, her experience with a specific solution in North Carolina. Okay, thank you, Doug. Sound check. Can can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, I see I have the driver's seat, so that means I have to change the slides, too. Uh, thank you. As Doug said, I'm Sarah Kuntz. Um, I'm the State Archivist from, from North Carolina, and I'm also a member of the Council of State Archivists. And my role today, following up after Doug, is to provide you with a brief overview for those of you that are not familiar with the Council of State Archivists and the State Archives programs in general with um, what we work on and some areas of opportunity and overlap. Um, there's a lot of what Doug said that resonates within our community as well, so I think there's some great um, chances for us to collaborate to improve on some of those opportunities that Doug had identified. So very briefly, the Council of State Archivists is very similar to NASIO in that it is a group that serves the 56 state and territorial archives. Those four bullets on the top there are our main uh, mission points, and today I'm really going to focus on those top three in our programs that serve um, our community um, in those first three bullets. A little brief word, too, I'm going to share about our recent initiatives. Um, I will get to the State Electronic Records Initiative in a minute, but I didn't want to uh, miss the opportunity to also talk about another great program that COSA worked on with, in conjunction with the IT community. It's called the Intergovernmental Preparedness for Essential Records Program, or IPER. This grew up after Hurricane Katrina, and it was a grant from FEMA. And part of the goal of that program was to unite the archives, emergency management, and IT communities within each state to develop training and deliver training on the identification and protection of essential records. So that was a great, great program, um, and those resources are still available. And so, for example, in North Carolina, um, that kind of brought in our business continuity office from within our Department of Information Technology in to help develop and deliver that training um, with us. So here's how you find COSA. This is a snapshot from our main webpage. Um, so it's statearchivist.org. If you want to check out some of our resources that are on there, you can see our main program areas at the bottom. Um, and again, we'll get to Siri in a minute. But I also wanted to pause to say that another space that COSA is very active in is in advocacy for archives. And specifically for this webinar, we're active in the area of advocacy um, for electronic records awareness raising. So every year in October, on October 10th or 1010, you will find us uh, leading a campaign to raise uh, public awareness about the importance of electronic records management and preservation. So now a little bit about Siri. Siri has really been um, the main program of focus uh, for COSA for the last several years, and there's been several really important components to that. The first one on our list is education and training. Um, part of the reason why this is so critical to us is just as Doug was wrapping up saying that you know, technology is always evolving in the NASIO world, well, the same thing is happening in the archives world. So in the old days, um, there weren't a lot of dramatic improvements in paper storage and management uh, technologies that came along all the time. That's not the case with electronic records. So we were finding starting in the mid-2000s that our community really needed to do a better job of educating ourselves and staying on top of trends and um, things that were happening in the field of electronic records management and preservation. So to that end, we started the Siri program in um, 2011, and that major component of education and training has taken the form of things such as um, intensive institutes for our membership to get together for a week and do training on electronic records management and preservation issues. We have webinars such as this webinar and other series of webinars about um, specific issues regarding electronic records management, um, and really just trying to make sure that we're staying on top of, of what's going on in, in the field, um, particularly in the IT world, because that will impact 
our electronic records, which is really, as we know, the way that state governments are maintaining their, their data now. Um, <clears throat> another major portion of, of Siri is the Digital Preservation Capability Self-Assessment. That was a, a tool that was um, developed with, uh, in conjunction with Charles Dollar and Lori Ashley. Lori's, we're going to hear from her in a minute. Um, and I will talk about that in a little bit more detail, but that's really our way to make sure that we were um, making our growth in this area um, quantifiable. It's not enough to just say, well, let's all do a better job. We wanted to see if we could really hang our hats on, on taking a snapshot of where we were and then providing our members with steps to improve their, their capability. And that model is based on um, two standards um, around our, our world for long-term preservation of, of, of electronic records, um, including the Open Archival Information System Reference Model and the Audit and Certification of Trustworthy Digital Repositories. Um, the third bullet point on this slide is a portal that we developed in conjunction with NHPRC funding. Um, it's called the PERTS Portal, um, or the Program for Electronic Records Training Tools and Standards. And the idea there was that we wanted to have a place and a space for our community to come, share information about what tools and resources were out there to help us improve our capabilities, as well as share our experiences and our own documentation and our own work from our individual states with each other. And then finally, um, we've spent some time last year in a um, IMLS uh, planning grant looking at who else was out there in this space that we could collaborate with, what other stakeholders were around that could help us move the ball forward in the conversation of electronic records management and preservation. Um, COSA has been in the past a, a big convener of different groups to come together and talk about issues. And we wanted to make sure we weren't uh, ruling out any potential stakeholders that were out there. And you will find us quite frequently collaborating with groups like NACIO, um, NAS, which is the National Association of Secretaries of State, and the National Governors Association. Because those offices and those associations tend to be big uh, power players in the records um, production environment. So now I'm going to take a couple minutes and focus on some of our resources on our website, thinking about the portal. So one of the things we did in designing the portal was um, we created this uh, framework. And the framework is tied to the components in the self-assessment. And the idea here is that we're identifying important components that are needed for us to improve our capabilities around the preservation of permanent electronic records. And then we're also providing our community with some tools and resources to um, improve their capabilities. And what would it look like? What do you need to do to improve yourself in, in each specific area? So this is a nice graphic that shows you the 15 components, you can see them numbered up here, of the model and how they are going to interact with that digital preservation infrastructure and services and then fit into our preservation repository. And again, this is centered around that small slice of state government data that would be of permanent value um, for, for forever. And then what that's going to look like in the real world in the portal is this is an example of one component. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about governance. So in the governance of permanent state data, you know, obviously if you're at level zero and you're scoring a zero on this component, you really haven't done anything about it. And then you start seeing your ability to move up by doing things like, well, we've created a framework for preservation governance. Um, we've, we've got it done. And then we're going to move up in our capability if that framework is more specific and it's identifying roles of stakeholders in the preservation of the various electronic records. And then you start seeing as you're moving up into level three and four capability that you're doing more to address specifically the international standards around governance. And then at, at, at optimal um, capability for governance, you not only have this well-developed plan and it's addressing the international standards, but you're also reviewing it and updating it on a regular basis. So this is an example of some of the tools that we thought would be useful for our members to actually think through what do I need to do in a particular area to improve my capability. Okay, and I thought I'd wrap up with a couple of slides. Um, it, you know, in listening to Doug and thinking through what COSA has as resources, what are some shared areas of interest between our two communities? Um, and where are some of the natural fits um, between the two of us. 
So in, in the uh, modern archival and records management world, um, I think you're going to find a lot of overlap, even if our language might be slightly different in how we uh, communicate those needs. So for example, um, a lot of the NACIO uh, materials that you'll see and the resources that Doug highlighted at the end of his piece talk about data across the enterprise. Well, really, that's what you're going to see from the State Archives, too, and this is a very important area of overlap. We see data now as a resource that's reaching across agencies, um, particularly in our records management environment. We no longer see records as individual pieces of paper in, file, in filing cabinets, and you're really going to see data um, across agencies that um, need to be scheduled and managed and preserved um, across the entire enterprise. And also to that end, um, you'll see a lot of NASIO things talk about the value of data. Data does need to be um, assigned a value. And in this case, in our world, um, think of that natural fit to the state archival community with our records uh, retention schedules, because that's really what a schedule does. It's our, it's our vehicle for identifying what records or data have enduring value, and then in ensuring that those, those um, records and data are preserved long term. And then uh, Doug, of course, spoke a lot about governance of data. Just like this is an important uh, topic to the IT world, very important to the archives world as well. Because what we're really seeing is um, a great transition. The old days, the state archival um, office would talk to an individual agency about that individual agency's paper records, and it was a two-way relationship. And it's much more dynamic now where you have agencies, particularly agencies using data sets across multiple agencies that are managed on, the, uh, on resources that are controlled by the IT department. And then you have the state archives on, on the third leg thinking about how to um, provide records retention on the top of that data. So um, we're seeing that this, it's very important that governance of data be really uh, an enterprise activity, not just with one individual agency, but across the entire landscape of state government. So when you're thinking about the Council of State Archivists and maybe your individual state archives in your state, um, I just created this list of a couple of places where there, I thought there could be some natural collaboration. I mentioned at the beginning continuity planning. Definitely there is a role within the state archives to assist the IT um, office within a state on continuity planning with, with um, state agencies. That's one of our major roles is to help groups understand what are your essential records and then what steps can you take to identify them long term so that there's good continuity of government. And you might not normally think of State Archives as a cost savings uh, collaborator, but we definitely can be. Um, in the world of records management, records management has a real value in terms of disposing of data on schedule as you are allowed to do by law. So we, we are never in the position of encouraging agencies to just stockpile that data and never get rid of it. So if you want to see your State Archives as a collaborator on cost savings, we absolutely would be on board for that because um, we find a lot of efficiencies records management primarily is also an efficiency kind of activity, and um, that can be applied, of course, to our electronic records. So classification is another big area of overlap, and this is probably the biggest one on the list. Um, I spent some time earlier this week looking at the new uh, NACIO publication on uh, better data security through classification, and I commend that to your reading if you haven't already had the opportunity to take a look at it. And throughout that report, you're going to find many, many places where the State Archives is going to want exactly the same thing as is suggested in this report from NACIO. So um, there's discussion on page three of the report about um, having an enterprise mentality with um, data classification. That's exactly what we're going to want to do, the same thing as well. And in looking ahead, um, there's a nod in that report to the importance of using records management as a, as a tool for classification. And then um, finally, uh, I think you'll find us to be a great community of best practices. We do enjoy sharing with each other and hearing what other states are doing, what successes they've had, and bringing that to the community at large. So I would definitely encourage you to um, think of us as a good place to look at for standards for the long-term preservation of data. If you need to know how to find us, um, here we have a, a space on our webpage that has a directory of every single state and territorial archives and how to get in touch with them. So thank you for that. I know I ran through things very quickly. hope I didn't go over too far over. I'll try to move this to Lori. Thanks, Sarah. Hold on. There we go. 
Great. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you. Um, as Sarah said, um, I was involved, have been involved with COSA for a while and even longer in um, advocating for long-term digital preservation, so I'm delighted to be with you. I'm going to run through my slides very quickly. There's just a handful of them because the information that's here is available through the Information Governance Initiative and Preservica's website. So as you heard from Sarah and, and Doug, there's a great deal of awareness about the fact that there are long-term records which need to be protected and kept. And that was from the 26 survey. And these are all the reasons, and you've heard some of those too, statutory and regulatory, of course, human resources, contracts, um, memory, which is what the archives are in um, business to support, um, and a lot of other reasons, environmental health and, and safety and, and other things. So there are a lot of good reasons for us to take good care of long-term digital information. And uh, I'm sure that you and your agencies and organizations can um, articulate these as well. So some new results, what's pre preventing us from um, really pulling the business value out of those long-term records? The practitioners that were surveyed talked about lacking dedicated uh, personnel, um, enough of the skills and capabilities um, and the proper tools. And I think that's some of the things that you heard in Doug's presentation and some of the survey results that NACIO found. Um, and that goes against the notion that we do gain a lot of value um, and uh, are able to provide services to citizens and consumers by leveraging that long-term information. So it's something that we need to address and, and get on with. We um, dug down a little bit from the 2016 research and asked more specifically about business functions or um, applications where these long-term um, records and information are being held. And, and I'm sure you won't be surprised um, that in legal operations or um, regulatory operations, there's uh, important information. Financial management as we um, make budgets and spend money and um, are accountable for um, how that's going on. Also HR management, um, Doug talked about succession planning and folks moving out of the workforce. And of course, those HR records are going to be really important as people go off into retirement and uh, leverage their, hopefully, their pension payments. Um, IP management is another one, intellectual property. And then you can see on the left-hand side that this stuff is spread all over the enterprise in transactional systems and accounting systems, collaborative environments like SharePoint and shared drives, email, social media, all sorts of systems have these records and we've got to figure out how to get a hold of them and manage that select set which have to be kept um, over successive technology refresh cycles. Um, so this question is a little bit skewed in its language towards the commercial sector, but um, rest assured that there were quite a number of public sector folks who participated. And the notion is here, if we fail to take care of long-term records, who will bear the brunt? And it's the folks who are leading our organizations, supporting our organizations, um, and making sure that there's governance over time. So these results are available um, through the Preservica site and also on the IGI site, and I um, invite you to use them. The graphics are available to folks to use and you can learn more about the um, survey results. So the last one here is just what are professionals saying is critical to preserving and governing long-term digital information and the top one is ensuring readability and usability. If we need to keep records long-term, we certainly want to be able to find them, read them, use them and assure their authenticity. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger and give him the remaining time here. So let me just take the ball. Thank you. Drag it down here. Oops. Let's see. Yes, I do. Take it from here, Roger. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up really quick here since we're running out of time. I'm going to talk about uh, really a case study, the uh, Kane email project at the Library of Virginia. Uh, governor Kane uh, was our governor from 2006 to 2010. And he was really the first governor who we were able to get in and help manage their electronic records, or so we thought, as I'll get to. Uh, to date, uh, we, we first went live with uh, this project, putting Governor Kane's email online in 2014, and to date we put 156,000 emails online. But this is really an access project. We never viewed this as a digital preservation project, but I believe there's some lessons lessons learned from this for the governance of long-term digital information. Um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, uh, the, the library uh, was obviously involved with providing the governor's office with, with in-depth records management training. We updated their records retention schedules. We met with them quarterly. They even came up with this beautiful electronic archival policy, which is this is just part of it, where they laid out everything they needed to do 
uh, et cetera. And state IT also got involved with uh, the Virginia Information of uh, Technology Agency. They even created uh, a template, a folder template for each governor's office employee that corresponded with their records retention schedule to help manage their email. So when the records came over in January of 2010 after Kane left office, uh, what did we expect? We expected that the records were organized and managed properly, that the records retention schedules had been followed. Uh, our biggest fear, I think, were the, was personally identifiable information within the email, uh, in, within constituent correspondence, mental health, attorney client, social security numbers, et cetera. But once we got the records, we realized that PII was not our biggest challenge. It was actually POO, which is not an accurate name. It's the poo, the, the junk, the crap that was in the collection. We received emails about bar tabs, relationship and dating advice. Uh, one of my favorites was an all day long email exchange of, of a lovers having a fight, which was entertaining, but it's not permanent digital records. So, this is my really my first takeaway uh, from this experience to the larger issue of, of challenging of managing this material is making sure that the digital records you're managing are really long term and should be saved. Uh, we thought that's what was happening here, but clearly it did not work. And this little uh, screenshot shows the total number of emails we got from each office, and then the number of non-records. And uh, I'll do the math for you uh, of the 553,000 or so that I've reviewed, 375,000 of those were non-records or non archival records. That's 67% of the material. And we thought this was actually being managed. We thought this data set was being managed, uh, but clearly it wasn't. So where'd we fail? And we quickly realized that uh, our guidance failed because we were not present at their creation when these records were actually begun, were, were created. Uh, the meetings and the trainings began, or records management training began well after the start of the administration. Uh, the electronic record policy that uh, I showed you in a previous slide wasn't an issue until December of 2007, nearly two years in the administration, and where a large number of people have come and gone by then. And the, the nice uh, PST file folder structure that wasn't rolled out till late 2007. So what's a possible solution for this? I, I view this, I've come to the conclusion that it's a three-legged stool uh, for managing this material. And uh, Doug and Sarah handled one and two that you, know, you need the state IT, uh, CIOs involved, you know, state archives, records management. Uh, but really, this is a people problem. The third person here is, and I feel just in Virginia, it's, it's state human resources. Uh, I mean, we can rate all the IT solutions and retention schedules, but if no one uses them, they're not going to work. So I, I view the second takeaway here as the need to view the governance of long-term digital information as a people problem. People create the records, the machines don't create the records. And I think state human resources, wherever they may be within your state government, needs to be part of the conversation. When you start the job, you should be trained on how to manage your own material. Otherwise, you're going to end up where it's going to be a ton of stuff down the road and no one's going to want to go through it in the, in the case of email. So the management begins at the beginning when you hire someone and they need to understand the responsibilities, the expectations, maybe make this part of the evaluation. Uh, I don't know if this is a perfect solution, but I think that's, they, that really needs to be part of the uh, conversation. And to end, this is just a little overview of where you can read more about the, the King Email Project portal page, find it, some blog posts. And uh, my final thought would be just to echo something that Sarah said, that uh, archives and records managers and CIOs are very much in co have a lot in common. We're both in the information business. And too often archives are viewed as the place of uh, dusty old records that are historic, et cetera. Well, that's not the case anymore. Uh, I field reference requests from the current office of the governor, and it's for information they need to do their to do their job. This isn't about history. This is just a continuation of uh, the life cycle of manage and management of electronic records.
And with that, I am done. So who do I hand this back to? Okay, thank you very much, Roger. If you can pass that back to me, please. It's David. All right. Okay, thank you. Well, guys, I did tell you you had a lot to get through uh, in today's short session, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our guest speakers for their concise and informative deliveries. Um, so we're going to move on to a Q&A session just very shortly. Um, so do get thinking of some questions. Use the uh, Q&A box on the WebEx on the right-hand side there to, to enter your questions. Um, Sarah mentioned the PERTS portal, so a whole host of information uh, and also an, a, a chance on the site to uh, sign up for the remaining uh, practical digital preservation uh, workshop, which is coming up uh, around the middle of June. A uh, number of big conferences coming up over the summer period. The Preservic is going to be at all of these, uh, COSA annual general meeting, Nagara, uh, both in Boise, and SAA coming up in Portland. Uh, if you want to see a live demo of Preservica, there's a session on Thursday uh, afternoon UK time, 10 a.m. Eastern. And you can register on the Preservica website, as well as a whole host of uh, white papers, case studies, videos, and other resources on the Preservica website. Okay, so we're going to move through to Q&A. I'm just going to look through and see if we've got some questions. I've got a question for Doug. Uh, this is Sarah. I'm not going to type. <laughs> um, you mentioned a, a, you know, kind of a transformation over to uh, cloud and and that type of thing. Uh, and we see a lot of phones. We see a lot of blogs. We see a lot of different types of storage devices now. Um, how do you see that fundamentally changing our relationship with IT as records? holders, some of these recent transformations that you were mentioning, or how we might interact with CIOs? Yeah, I, I think a good conversation about that is, uh, is uh, in fact, all of you have brought it up, and I, I failed to mention I should have, and it's the whole challenge of, you know, from the standpoint of records and dark data, is that states have a extraordinary amount of uh, both data and, and, and electronic records that uh, do not need to be uh, preserved and don't need to be maintained. I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of numbers I've seen thrown around. But I think that's one of the challenges is that we have this catch-22 with the, the availability of cloud storage, which is actually declining every year by 3 or 4%, the actual cost. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you have that declining curve. At some point, um, the, the cost of storage has been, you know, declining dramatically from a technical standpoint. The capacity has been increasing and the cost per gigabyte has been declining dramatically. At some point, uh, that's going to reach a saturation. It's going to level off. It can, can't continue in that manner. But the cost issues create challenges because uh, I, I see, you know, extraordinary um, storage now um, for low cost. And so states are doing uh, kind of what Roger described as they're dumping everything. So you now have uh, capabilities with uh, Microsoft Office 365. Most states are moving to that or some other solution where uh, individual employees are getting 20 and 50 gigabyte inboxes. And so I think the, the cooperation has to be between uh, the electronic records, the archivists, and others to try to uh, separate that and make sense of this dramatic growth uh, of data, which in fact doesn't be, need to be retained, needs to be uh, follow a record retention schedule, it needs to be deleted. It needs get, but uh, states aren't doing that. They're, they have, and I think there's, particularly in the dark data side, um, there is risk uh, in, in keeping that data. Uh, and I think that's something they don't realize. So I think that's going to be the challenge is that the, the, the storage, and you know, there's great opportunities with cloud storage and cloud services, but I think that they, it can't be done outside of the architectural governance. And that's some of the things we've seen. Uh, and, you know, and again, our argument, we're biased. It can't be done where individual state agencies are out uh, and acquiring these services without some consultation at the state sales office because 
the, the long-term enterprise direction may be going in a different different mode. So I think uh, I think that's a challenge. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Doug, I've got a question for you here. Uh, what, what's coming up yeah. next for NASIO? Are there any other reports coming out uh, this year or next? Uh, we do. We do. We actually have a number of things uh, uh, on the table. So we, uh, uh, Sarah mentioned data classification. Uh, data classification part two will be out very shortly. I already have the current draft. So that will be out in the next few weeks. Uh, and it will focus on really outlining a little bit more uh, kind of practical I wouldn't call it a model, but it will certainly be a steps towards creating data classification for security and, and aligning that to the NIST framework is, uh, is what we really did. And that, that's very challenging in state governments. But we do have a number of states that have, in fact, built successful data classification policies uh, and compliance across the executive branch. So we're going to highlight that and highlight uh, you know, how to get that done. Uh, we have uh, briefs coming out on uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, that, again, is not under the purview of the state CIO, but there's some serious security and privacy and data management issues in the future, and particularly when states might be using connected or autonomous vehicles in their fleet services. So we're going to, again, that's more leading edge. We're going to speculate on uh, what states need to do around some of these topics. We are going to continue with our work with uh, Accenture around agile uh, delivery, agile project management and software delivery. If you haven't seen our initial findings, they were released the end of about a month ago, and we have continuing findings and interviews that will take place with a uh, kind of a final report uh, that will be delivered in October at an annual conference. So a lot more and other things that are uh, probably too premature for me to talk about, but a lot on the agenda uh, for the next four or five months. Great. Sounds like there's a, a lot in the pipeline there. Um, mm -hmm. So a comment from Hope. So Hope says, great point about education, data management. Uh, education is almost essential. And then a question uh, for you, Doug. What would be the main tenants of such a curriculum? Uh, again, I, I, I go back to our kind of inherent foundation around uh, making sure that this is an alignment, that there's enterprise architectural discussions around all these. What we find in, uh, and a continuing challenge in the states is uh, because of the lack of long-term leadership continuity in the state CIO's office, uh, we recognize that as a challenge. Uh, the average CIO tenure today in the states is 28 months. And so when we issued the uh, call to action in 2007 on electronic records and digital preservation, uh, there's only one CIO currently in office that actually read that. So we've had multiple transitions since then. So I think that uh, whatever, whatever curriculum and education has got to be a kind of a continuous cycle of, uh, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, and do it over and over again because um, I think that's the challenge of a lot of uh, our advocacy work in some of these spaces is that uh, we, we have a continuing churn of leadership uh, and that's probably not part of the priority as they're coming in. So I think uh, part of that curriculum has got to be understanding the, the shift in the business models and how that presents opportunities uh, for the archival community to collaborate uh, with the uh, with the CI organization, but I think as the archivists and electronic records managers and others know, uh, it's tough to uh, uh, to make to make those relationships stick. Uh, that takes years in some cases to build these initiatives, and CIOs just aren't around that long. Okay, superb. Uh, another question is coming from Mary. Uh, if services are being more centralized, does this mean that IT is managing individual agency records? If so, how prepared are state IT for addressing requirements for more long-term or permanent records, such as uh, thinking about migration and fixity, et cetera? Yeah, I don't see this as, a, as an authority and control issue. I see it more, I think that the command and control model has, has uh, long since died. Uh, I think it's more of a collaborative model. The state CI organizations uh, in many states clearly have moved to a consolidated, optimized, and in some cases a highly centralized model. We have a number of states now where all of the CIO and all of the IT employees and all agencies actually report under the CIO umbrella, but they still reside in the agency. So I think the data, the, the state agencies are still the official custodian of the data. Uh, so the CIOs just may be providing services at an enterprise level to leverage the economies of scale. 
uh, and do it. And, and again, I think the future could be that's off premise, which is certainly not envisioned uh, several years ago. We have several states today where their mainframe is a virtualized machine. It's a mainframe as a service. It no longer exists as big iron in a data center in state capital. And that's kind of the iconic vision of most states is you have a mainframe. All our states have realized that uh, that's, again, not sustainable. I think we're going to see that with some of these other services that they're going to be looking to leverage uh, perhaps the economies of commercial cloud providers. So that means that it, it's, it's not an authoritative issue uh, under, it's more of a collaboration. They're going to have to work with uh, records managers and archivists to, uh, to, and those individual agencies to make sure that their differences are all accommodated. So again, I, I don't see this as, as one where it's just going to be a, one size does not fit all in this space. We know that. So I think that's going to have to be the, the uh, mantra of the day is, that flexibility and, and, and policy adaptability. Okay, thank you very much, Frank, Doug. So um, we are a little bit over time, um, but I think it's been a fantastic, informative session. And I would like to say a huge thank you uh, to all of our speakers, Doug, uh, to Sarah, to Laurie, uh, and to Roger. Um, the, uh, there will be a survey that will populate at the end when you close the WebEx. Uh, we do appreciate any feedback you've got, um, both us here at Preservica and also the team at COSA. Um, so with that then, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we look forward to you joining our, our next session in June and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.